and welcome to South to North. And as usual, we're coming to you from the WITS campus in Johannesburg. As half the planet knows, the African Cup of Nations just kicked off here in South Africa. And the eyes of football fans around the world are focused on my country. I'm lucky enough to have as my first guest a man who has captained and been amongst the highest goal scorers for his country and is one of the most recognizable footballers Germany has ever produced. The hugely famous Michael Ballack. Welcome to South to North and welcome to my country. Hello, Ines. We miss you on the pitch. What have you been up to lately, apart from driving your car very fast? <laughs> you heard about it? I heard about South it. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm retired in six months. And um, uh, of course, I miss the football. Football was everything for me for over the last more or less 20 years, uh, 15 years, 17 years professional. And of course, I miss it, but um, I am also feel really happy that um, I'm at the stage now where um, I have some other things to do, you know, other important things in life, family, and there are so many things yes. where, you can, uh, what you, where you can do something well, and uh, that's why I'm here as well. But 2012 was a difficult year for you. I mean, a serious injury, and I know you went through a divorce and then retirement. How are you coping? Um, I'm a positive guy, you know, and um, of course it was not easy uh, on the pitch, off the pitch as well, family-wise a little bit, uh, but um, everything is fine. I have three healthy boys at home um, and uh, yeah, the football is behind me now. Uh, I had a really, really good career. I'm really pleased with my career. The end was not so well, but it's part of, of, the, of football sometimes. You have good times and bad times and... And was not so well, but I'm all together, I'm really happy. You had a fallout with the German coach, Joachim Löw, and you actually refused to play in that friendly match with Brazil. Do you regret that? Yeah, uh, we have a little tradition in Germany. If you are uh, as big players, they reach uh, more or less 100 caps, then um, they get a final game from, from the Federation. And in my case, it wasn't the case, And uh, but it was not only this, it was also... Uh, the development over the last uh, 11 months after my injury. Um, he didn't uh, invite me anymore for the team. I was still the captain, or I thought I was still the captain. And so there were a few things which they didn't run really well. And finally I said, uh, no, I don't want to play this, this game. Um, he accepted, I accepted. Uh, it was not the best choice from, from both. Uh, we could do better, everyone, the, uh, uh, the German Federation, me too. But altogether, I, I think I had fantastic years for the... I understand the now that you're optimistic, your life is full, your life is busy. But for a talented footballer, when football has been your whole life, as you just, you've just described, when you get injured, does that feel like the end of the world? Always. At that moment? <laughs> Always, because uh, at this moment, I, I didn't know that it was the end, because, uh, especially in the national team, because um, I was still playing for, for Chelsea. I was 33, of course, in a in the autumn of my, of my career, but um, I felt well, and uh, I didn't know that it was my end of, of, uh, or end of the career in the national team. So all what I had to do is coming back was what I always done after, uh, after injury. I, I, fight, I fight it, I came back on the pitch, and, and what you can do as a player, the only thing is perform on the pitch. And I couldn't get the chance, especially in the national team, and that's why it was, was a little bit of a disappointment for me. Is, is football you, you, something that you, you do because you have the talent and you love it, or it's just a job like any other? No, I think footballers, all, I think all of them, and I can speak for all, uh, they're really pleased that they, the, the, the hobby, what you love, you know, when you're young. I grew up at four or five. I went out every day playing soccer, you know, and suddenly with 18... Uh, I become a professional football player and that's something really, really special uh, when you love something and you can do it as your, as your profession and uh, that's what I've done the whole life so far uh, until, the uh, until the last summer. And that's why I'm really, really pleased with my life so far. And now I want to give something back. But I understand you played for Chelsea, but deep down in your heart, which is your favorite team? <laughs> It's difficult to say because I felt always well in, in all teams which I played. Uh, starts from Kaiserslautern or Chemnitz FC where my career starts. And East Germany went on to, to Leverkusen, Bayern Munich, big, the biggest club in, in Germany. And of course the, the move to, to Chelsea, London. Um, was a fantastic time, fantastic experience for me. Uh, in another country, new language and uh, another... Another life uh, apart from, from, from Germany. So altogether, 
I really enjoyed the time in London. Okay, still on football. Lastly, you played the number 13, which is known as a bad omen, a bad number that brings bad luck and associated with negative things. Uh, did you choose that number or was it yeah. just imposed on you? No, I choose this number because uh, actually it was a funny story because uh, I, I moved to, when I moved to Bayer Leverkusen, um, there was a retired player, also really famous Rudi Feller, mm -hmm. who uh, was using this number and uh, actually the club said no player anymore can wear this number. And, uh, but I didn't like the 15. 15 was the only number who was free, so Why? I went to, to Rudi and ask him if I can wear this number because I'm not superstitious, so that's why uh, I want to have the 13. And he said straight away, Michael, I give it free for you and since then I'm wearing number 13. Well, you're not just in South Africa for football. You're on a mission. Tell us about it. Yeah, I'm here also uh, with, uh, as an ambassador, international ambassador of, U, of the UNAIDS. And yeah, I'm very pleased. It's also a big challenge and a ex new experience for me uh, uh, to be here in South Africa on a place where so many people are um, infected by HIV. Mm. So we are here for a few days. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward for this mission. Okay, now let's take a closer look at some of the work that you're doing and what the campaign is all about. On the pitch, you can play hard and take risks to score. But with HIV, you play with your life. Be smart, protect yourself. That's absolutely fantastic. You make a good referee, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Why AIDS? There's so many good causes in the world. Why did you choose that one? Yeah, because I'm interested in uh, I thought I can make a difference, you know, in um, uh, give attention and using UNAIDS uh, uh, together, give them a larger audience, you know, using football as a platform, myself. And I thought AIDS is, is everyone's business, you know. Everyone should take care of it. And if you see the numbers, you know, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Mm, especially coming from this country. But there's still a lot of stigma attached to HIV and AIDS. Oh, sure, the world is making progress, but there's still a lot of stigma. How do you deal with that? Yeah, that's difficult because it's, we have to continue to continue all the time because, uh, as you said, it's a stigma and uh, it's difficult to, to bring it to the people, you know, to protect yourself or speak about it. And even if you are affected, it's even more difficult. And that's why I think um, I'm using myself, Just I'm just a, a, sport, a sportsman, but uh, to speak about, you know, don't be shy, talk about, but also on the other side, that people have the chance to uh, get the right treatments, you know, get prevention, get the right informations before they get infected. And that's all things where we have to uh, speak about all the time. With, with HIV and AIDS, it is quite an overwhelming problem for our continent. And sometimes with good causes, the more you work, the more the needs expose themselves. Do you ever feel overwhelmed in this fight? No, because we, we, um, we want to do it well, you know, and uh, all what I can do, um, it's go to the people and, and show my support with UNAIDS together, you know, and uh, it's, it's a, a basically walk, uh, starts on the bottom, goes up, 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 high, politic, you know, uh, we need uh, support from everywhere, you know, and uh, it's hard work, but uh, altogether, I have to say, uh, it's, it's a good work, you know. And How it do makes... people respond to you, especially your soccer fans? How do they respond to you when you are now on the mission on HIV and AIDS? Very well, very well, because uh, even now, nobody, not all, and a lot of uh, people knows me from football, you know, and they didn't know what I'm doing behind or I'm doing this kind of work as well, or I support this kind of work. And so they're a little bit surprising, but they're really, really uh, happy that I'm doing this. And um, important is that you get attention, you know, and that's our target. Now, Michael, I know that you didn't come to South Africa alone. You are here in South Africa with the man in charge of the UN's AIDS program, Michel Sidibe. And in fact, he joins us now. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Have a seat, please. Oh, I forgot to wear my red ribbon. 
Uh, don't worry we'll, about that. We'll do that next time. You want mine? <laughs> no, no, not at the moment. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for joining us on South to North. Now, you've been at the helm of fighting HIV and AIDS all over the world. Are perceptions changing? Yes, perception is changing. You have to remember just uh, 10 years back, AIDS was uh, a, just uh, a gay plague. And uh, people were uh, scared of each other. We were not having any hope. And today is completely different. With people like uh, Michael Balak, we are uh, breaking the conspiracy of silence. People are coming out. People are not scared anymore. And people are knowing that uh, if they have access to treatment, they can uh, live longer. Is sexual behavior changing, though, as a result of the campaign that we've just seen? Yes, uh, se sexual behavior is changing. Because uh, just remember, a few years ago, we were having only Senegal and Uganda as an example, today we are talking about uh, almost uh, 56 countries. As success stories, you mean? As success stories. We have been able uh, to break the trajectory of this epidemic, reducing uh, even the levels of new infection by more than 25%. So we are seeing also that uh, prevention programs are working. Country like Malawi. 70% reduction on new infection. In a decade, I understand. In, yes. How did and they do that? I think they just uh, did uh, what we should do, uh, engaging leadership, making sure that uh, we change completely uh, the perception of uh, we have about young people, making young people more actors of change, not just seeing them as a beneficiary, passive beneficiaries of our program, by giving them skill, knowledge, so girls can negotiate their sexuality in a responsible manner. That is very important. And it's happening in different places. Ethiopia, 90% reduction. South Africa, who would have believed that we would have reduced by more than 50% the new infection just a few years back? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, I know that uh, we've, spoke to, we've spoken to Michael about how strongly he feels about that. Does having celebrities supporting that cause actually help? You know, commitment, heart, like uh, people uh, 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 um, like Michael, or just uh, helping us to build the bridge, the bridge with the common people. What is very important is uh, to communicate in very simple manner, and that's what a celebrity is doing for us. Someone like Michael is helping us to fight stigma, discrimination, better than anyone else. Is bringing young people energy and uh, making sure that uh, uh, they become a good models in their communities. And that is important. I'm just a face, you know? I'm just a face. People have to understand what we want, and that's, if we can do it better, or we save one life, then we have success, you know? One exactly. step at a time. Now, there, there was a time, you've just given us the success stories, but there was a time when HIV and AIDS were very overwhelming here on the continent. To what extent does the type of leader a country has play a role in the success stories? You know, take example of uh, uh, South Africa. South Africa is a very good example. Uh, four years back, when I was uh, meeting the President Zuma for the first time and asking him to really take this as a part of his legacy and trying to put it not just as a, a disease, but trying to look at it as the issues of social justice, redistribution of opportunity, making sure that the poorest segment of his country will have access to treatment. No one would have believed that we could have 1.9 million people on treatment today in South Africa. Are there still some myths, though, associated with HIV and AIDS, do you find? I think I am seeing um, in general today the world changing. The major challenge we are facing is uh, the problems uh, of uh, human right. People who are hiding themselves today because their sexual orientation. The prejudice associated. Prejudice associated to that one. People who are injecting drugs, who are considered as criminal, or sex workers, who are excluded uh, from uh, the mainstream of the response. That is uh, something which is painful because when those people are not part of our response, we are losing them. They don't have access to information. Mm. They don't have access to treatment. They don't have access to all the protective measures we could have. You've mentioned something very important, access to information. It's all very well now to have the ARVs that are saving millions of lives. But 
some areas you find people have the wrong information about ARVs, they're not using them properly. How do you intervene there? I think what is very important is to work with uh, people who are uh, in the front line, making sure that uh, we reinforce the interface between community and service provider making sure that those uh, community will have uh, a better information in terms of uh, uh, having access to these services first and using treatment uh, properly. Because your point is very important. Country like Malawi or Kenya, we know that the people who have been initiating, for example, treatment, 40% of them abandon their treatment. Mm. But we saw uh, also in country like uh, uh, Mozambique, just next door, that uh, when you use community approach, almost 90% of those people remain on treatment. So it's important to engage community, to change their understanding, and uh, reinforce the interface between service providers. Let's talk community. about some of the socioeconomic uh, context that informs our responses to HIV and AIDS. It takes place in the context of poverty. When somebody has ARVs, yet they do not have food to eat, that complicates the fight even more. No, you're right. Uh, also, more than 40% of people who are uh, uh, dropping uh, uh, IRV is uh, due to uh, the fact that they don't have enough uh, food, they don't have uh, a regular uh, meal, and that uh, is a very uh, critical issue because it's not just about uh, uh, not having meals. It's about also which type of innovation we need to, to, to do in terms of producing medicine which can be given to people who don't have regular meals, like in the developed world. So UNAID is working very strongly to advocate with a, a producer of those medicines to have what we call a, a treatment 2.0, new generation of medicine, which will have uh, less toxicity, but which could be also given to uh, poor people. And that is very important. Now, we know certain countries like the United States, they are major donors of AIDS awareness programs here on the, um, on, on the African continent. As far as that is concerned, we, at some point we heard about donor fatigue. Do we have enough resources to tackle this disease? Almost 90% of the African people who are on treatment today or on treatment based on the resources coming from uh, PEFAR, US Emergency Fund, or Global Fund, which is not sustainable. This dependency crisis, we need to address it. And we are seeing a, a new movement coming from uh, African leaders, a new vision, the roadmap of uh, African Union, where we are trying to really help countries to look at what they can uh, do to have an alternative approach. Let's talk a little bit about HIV-positive mothers. Can they breastfeed? Because that's one of the most popular questions when it comes to HIV You know, HIV the first and thing we need to do is to stop the transmission from mother to child. It's unacceptable that in 2012 we still have more than 300,000 babies born with HIV in Africa. We can stop it. We have already examples in Botswana, Namibia, South Africa, in different parts of this continent where we are almost close to elimination of the transmission and having a new generation free of HIV is possible. And then, of course, breastfeeding, you can do it. Uh, but you can do it with uh, 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 accompaniment because when you, you are already positive, you need to be on treatment to uh, minimize the risk of transmission uh, to the baby. All right, well, we're still continuing with our conversation. The more expert knowledge we have, the better. My final guest is someone at the forefront of the medical struggle to conquer HIV AIDS. Professor Lynn Morris leads a research team at South Africa's National Institute for Communicable Diseases. At the end of last year, they announced that they had made a significant breakthrough in the search for an HIV vaccine. She joins us now. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. Please have a seat. Tell me a little bit more about this breakthrough. Well, you know, this is basic research. I'm a lab rat. And um, so we've been studying women who are infected with HIV. And we found that a few of these women made these super potent antibodies that are the kinds of antibodies that we want a vaccine to induce. And so we basically figured out how these antibodies were made uh, in these two women. And that's going to guide us in terms of how to, to make a vaccine. HIV is very variable, 
and the virus changes all the time. And we need to mimic that process when we, when we vaccinate people in order to induce these special kinds of antibodies. When you say they've got these special antibodies, does that mean they can't be infected? No, so this is, um, you know, the, the real irony of the, of, the, of the story in a way, because while these women do have these potent antibodies, very sadly, those antibodies do not help those women because um, HIV is, is, is able to get around most obstacles. These antibodies, as a single antibody, it's a bit like a single drug. Mm -hmm. And we all know that we can't give one drug. We give, we give triple therapy because we need to attack the, the virus at multiple spots. So, so while these antibodies do not help these infected women, they have really guided us as to how we can get our immune system to make these antibodies by vaccination. And if, if we can do that, if those antibodies are present in HIV negative people before they see the virus. Yes, that's what so, I meant yes, by does yes. that mean you can't so be infected? So basically, you've yeah. got to have the antibody before, before the virus because mm -hmm. in the presence of a replicating virus, unfortunately, they're not very effective. Okay, so is this something to be excited about? You know, it is, it's basic research, um, but it is a clue because we've really been unsure how these antibodies actually evolved. The virus is responding to the immune system initially, mm -hmm. and it's making changes, and completely inadvertently it makes a change that then becomes the, the stimulus to make these potent antibodies. Mm. I so, see you're smiling there, yeah, Michelle, yeah. so that would really going to, going to lessen the load, isn't well, it? Completely, because I, I believe that will change completely the perspective of what uh, we are doing today. We will be able at least to have a hope uh, to end this epidemic. And that is why uh, uh, people like Lynn are so important in our work. Okay. Lynn, but how far are we from a vaccine? So, or right, a cure? vaccine is a long way away. Um, and that's why, you know, the existing prevention strategies are very crucial that people follow that. But we do have, I mean, what's called our prevention toolbox is expanding. There are lots of ways that people can can protect themselves. We have had some success. There was a, a, a vaccine trial done in Thailand in 2009 that showed some partial effect and people are now working again to, um, you know, to improve on that. And then we hope that the concept that we are now putting forward will also be picked up by vaccine developers and tested. But it, a vaccine is a long way away. Is there, is there a lot of collaboration amongst uh, scientists Absolutely. and experts? Like I mean, yourself? this is really a global effort. Um, we collaborate a lot with the US and Europe and, and of course, Thailand. Apart from the vaccine and the cure, have we discovered everything there is to know oh, about no, HIV and AIDS? Oh, <laughs> she mean, wouldn't say that. She's the scientist and she said she's a lab brat. Yes. So you want to justify your presence in the lab? Yes, yes. <laughs> no, I mean, we know a lot about HIV, more than any other virus. But, um, but there's still a lot we don't know. It's a very clever virus. I know that there are different strains of HIV. Does that mean if I'm here in South Africa and someone is in India, we have a different strain or you find different strains in the same country? Because it's such a variable virus, it sort of evolved, evolved separately in different countries. Now, there's a big debate about how important that is really in terms of developing vaccines or developing drugs. It hasn't been an issue in terms of drug development, a major issue. I mean, there are some examples where it is, but generally the drugs work against all of these different viral types. Mm -hmm. um, I think the question for vaccines is still needs to be addressed, whether we need to be making a vaccine for a South African virus and then for a, a virus that circulates in Thailand. But, uh, but certainly what we need to do is just to make a vaccine that, that stimulates the right immune response and then we can start tailoring it to the different subtypes of the virus. Well, uh, Michael said that he was very, very optimistic. Michelle, you're also optimistic in this uh, line of work. But speaking purely as a scientist, do we have a reason <laughs> yeah, to absolutely. be optimistic? I mean, we have made huge strides in terms of dealing with HIV. Um, I mean, we really have. And we're starting to see the impact of that on a global level. Um, I think the awareness is, there's a huge level of awareness, there's a lot, large number of people on, on treatment, um, but we do need to, to continue the fight and, and, and get a vaccine against HIV. And also a cure, that's, you know, that's, a, that's for people who are already infected, this uh, idea that you could purge the body of the virus. A lot of people working on a cure as well. Um, so we, we definitely need to keep up the pressure. Uh, in terms of fighting HIV. In fact, a lot of our economies certainly depend on it. Well, I've learned a lot from you this evening. Thank you very Thank you. much traveling all the way from Germany just to speak to me. Thank Enjoy you. the African Cup of Nations while you're still Thank in you South Africa. Much. Thanks indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. And as Michael would say, be smart, protect yourself. 
prevention is still the best cure we have. You can tweet your questions, comments, and opinions to at AJ South to North or find us on Facebook. See you next week. Bye-bye.